Hello, Walden Church. Uh, last week we talked about um, messing up, right? Being in a hot mess. And it seems like a lot of those opportunities come by, right? We have lots of opportunities to mess up in life. Why is that? Well, we do things that we know we shouldn't and we make mistakes. Sometimes we make mistakes unintentionally, right? And I thought, let's start off with something funny, right? Let's start off with funny mistakes. <laughs> and you'll find the funniest mistakes when companies try to expand their product into another country. And they have some issue with the translation. For instance, when GM tried to introduce the Chevy Nova into South America, they didn't know that in Spanish, Nova means no go. So kind of hard to sell a car that no goes. The National Dairy Association, of course, you know, had huge success with their Got Milk campaign a long time ago. And uh, they had some issue, though, when that slogan went into Mexico and they translated it to, uh, are you lactating? When Coca-Cola was first introduced to China, they were trying to find Chinese characters that would phonetically make the same sound, Coca-Cola. And they were debating about which Chinese characters to use. However, if you translated the characters, they were either stood for female horse fastened with wax or bite the wax tadpole. Pepsi didn't do too well in China either. They had their campaign come alive with Pepsi uh, with the Pepsi generation, that slogan translated to Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the dead. We all make mistakes, right? We're not perfect, right? We are not perfect. Some of our mistakes, though, are probably more private, right? We, sometimes they're public, sure, but a lot of our mistakes, we are the only ones that know about them. But the good news is we all make them. We are in good company when we make mistakes. Some mistakes are super embarrassing. <laughs> we try to deny it. We may even call it something other than a mistake, right? We'll say, oh, that wasn't a mistake, right? If a driver makes a mistake, we say it was an accident. If a teacher makes a mistake, we'll just say, oh, that's, an, that's a new theory. If, if a barber makes a mistake, we'll say, oh, that's a new hairstyle. But the best thing to do is just admit that you made a mistake. 1 Corinthians 10 says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. Right? We should admit it. When we make a mistake, we should just admit it. Because we're in good company. We can learn from our messes. We can learn from our mistakes. After all, post-it notes were invented by mistake. Teflon was invented by mistake. The discovery of America, a mistake. If you're going through a mess in life, we may not like it, but it's a great opportunity to grow, could even be a good opportunity to make a new discovery. IBM, they agree. It's rumored, it's rumored that their in-house motto is fail faster. When we let our messes become the path to learning, I think we can find success a lot faster. Now, for some of us, finding the light out of our mess can be a long one. And I think a good first start is right here, you know, in church. I know it, it seems logical that when life is a mess, then I'm gonna stay out of sight, right? You know, when I clean up my act, then I'll come to church. After all, I, I, I don't want people to see me like this. But that's what church is for. Church is for messy people. Have you ever looked at a neighbor who's Life is just one giant train wreck. You look up hot mess in the dictionary and your neighbor's picture is right there. What's our response to that? When we see that, what's our response? We say, y'all need Jesus. Ain't it the truth? Ain't it the truth? It's the mess that brings us together. And it's the admission of that mess. We all need Jesus. That's what makes church work. You know why? Because Jesus goes where he's needed. That's what we want to talk about today. Jesus goes where he's needed. When you read our most memorable Bible stories about Jesus, you see people whose lives were a wreck. 
lost, messy, broken. And Jesus goes to them. He grabs their hands. He lifts them up out of their mess. It's the mess that brings us together. Jesus then goes where he's needed. Look at this. He says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, right? The mess. God so loved that mess that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We all know that part, right? But us messy people, <laughs> we need the next verse, especially when we feel like we need to stay away from church. I'm going to stay away from church. I'm going to stay away from my friends. My life is too much of a mess. My husband's sick. I'm walking on crutches, and you think, I'll go back to church when I'm better. But what does Jesus tell Nicodemus? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And here we go. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus did not come into the world to hold the mess up to your face. That's not how you love a person. That's how you train a dog, okay? That's how you potty train a dog. When, when you potty train a dog, you show the dog their mess and you say, no, God doesn't do that. And that's not why he came. Look at these famous Bible stories. John 8, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning. He came again to the temple. All the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Who has, has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go from now on and sin no more. Jesus says to the person who is caught in sexual sin, Neither do I condemn you. Jesus did not come to condemn the sexual sinner. Why did he come? In order that the world might be saved through him. Luke 19, Jesus entered Jericho and he was passing through and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was chief tax collector and he was rich and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Zacchaeus was not a good citizen. He was an extortionist. Right? Can you imagine looking at a fellow Jew or a fellow American and thinking, I can't believe we both live in the same country. I can't believe this person shares my lineage, shares my heritage. I can't believe this person thinks that he's my brother. And yet Jesus goes to eat at his house. Jesus did not come to condemn the extortionist. Why did he come? John 3, 17, in order that the world might be saved through him. In John chapter 4, Jesus is alone. He sent his disciples on to buy groceries. And during the hottest hour of the day, that woman came to the well. You know which one. The one everybody talks about. The one everybody points fingers at. The one everybody accuses and blames talks about behind her back, that woman came to the place where Jesus was to draw water. In John 4, Jesus said to her, go out and call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands and the one you have is not your husband. What you have said is true. 
The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. She was a half-breed. She was part of a group of people that was considered to be an unlawful race. You don't talk to Samaritans. And she had a bad reputation on top of that. Five husbands is a lot of husbands, even today, right? But Jesus doesn't condemn her either. Illustration after illustration from Bible stories that you know, Bible stories that illustrate for us how it should be. Three messy lives. Three people who had screwed up their lives. They dug their own hole, but Jesus doesn't condemn them. He doesn't accuse them. Instead, it's the mess that draws him near. Jesus goes where he's needed. Their mess is the reason that he came. One time Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Who is Jesus? Who is the Son of God? He is your guide. He is the good shepherd. When sheep are lost, they need someone to come find them and guide them out of their mess. If you dig your own grave and fall in, Jesus doesn't come by and point and laugh. No, he comes to you as your way out. In John 8, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Who is Jesus? Who is the Son of God? He is the light that guides you out of the dark. See, I think we got it wrong. I do. When we are walking through darkness, when we are struggling, we typically stay away from our friends. We stay away from the church. We don't want to be a bother. We don't want to answer a lot of questions. We don't want people to open doors for us. We don't want people to see us and feel sorry for us. But don't you see? Don't you get it? If you are living in darkness, you need light. And Jesus said he's not just a light. He said he's the light of life. Listen, when you've got a flat tire on the side of the road and you're staring at your you know, situation and you don't know what to do, or let's say you're at home and you're looking at a, a filthy house. There's, there's, you know, clothes everywhere. There's dishes everywhere. And you have guests coming over. When you look at your backyard and it's overgrown with sticker bushes and broken sprinkler heads and broken fence and ungroomed trees, what do you do? You call for help. You call for help. When you look around this morning, I hope you're not thinking that all of us have our acts together and that you're the only one who needs help. We all need help. You, you can just park your hospital bed right next to mine. We need a solution. We need a roadmap. When you are in a mess, you need a way out. And Jesus always goes to where he's needed. Jesus walks into the lives of three people in the Bible. And he extends his hand and he says, I am the way out. Vernon Manning, who's the author of Ragamuffin Gospel, says, whatever your failings may be, we need not lower our eyes in the presence of Jesus. We need not hide all that is ugly and repulsive in us. Jesus comes not for the super spiritual, but for the wobbly and weak need who know they don't have it all together and who are not too proud to accept the handout of amazing grace. As we glance up, we are astonished to find the eyes of Jesus open with wonder, deep with understanding, and gentle with compassion. Why did Jesus come? It wasn't to condemn the world. It wasn't to condemn. It wasn't to judge. It was to be a blessing. He tells the woman caught in adultery, neither do I condemn you. He tells the woman at the well, you will never thirst again. Zacchaeus is so excited that Jesus is coming over, he, he tells Jesus, now I will help. Now I will help others. You see, when, when we're in the mess, we feel shame, we feel embarrassment, and we believe, perhaps, that we're going through some sort of punishment. You know, God must be punishing me. God's, God's angry with me. And we stay away from his church because we think, well, he doesn't like me right now. But tell me something. Is that how you would act with your own children? 
with your own kids. I mean, when you find out that your kids, your kids are in deep trouble, you find out your kids are in deep trouble, is your first instinct, well, I'm going to punish them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to insult them. No, our first impulse is, I'm going to help them. Do you want perfect, obedient kids? Or do you just want them in your life? No matter what. What's more important to you? Their loyalty and obedience? Or their presence? Look at how Jesus calls Matthew to be his disciple. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at his tax collector booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous but sinners. The first thing Jesus says to his disciples is follow me, right? Follow me to safety. Follow me away from this life and to a better one. Why did Jesus come? For perfect people? No. Jesus said, I came for people just like Matthew. You know, the, the rest of you ignore him. The rest of you call him names. The rest of you point fingers and make up jokes about him. You leave him on the outside. But I came for people just like him. And, and let's be real, many of the messes that Jesus fixed were things like blindness and being crippled, people who were demon-possessed. Those messes were not that person's fault. Matthew and Zacchaeus, they made those messes themselves. The woman caught in adultery, she made her mess. So another part of Jesus' time on earth was instructing us how not to make a mess. Jesus wasn't just reactionary in his healing. He also tried to educate us to lead us away from a potential mess. When the choice came, he wanted us to be able to recognize which choice led to a mess and which one didn't. I mean, look at his most famous teaching, the Sermon on the Mount. This is just one huge tutorial on how not to make a mess. Think about all the subject matters that he covers. Ways to be blessed, anger, lust, divorce, keeping your promises, taking revenge, loving your enemies, giving to the poor, prayer, fasting, tithing, worry, judging, and the golden rule. All words to live by. All ways in which if we obeyed, <laughs> we could stay out of the mess. And at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the whole thing, he ties it all up in a bow, he wraps it up and he says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. In other words, wise living is following Jesus. Wise living is following Jesus. Staying out of the mess is obeying Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount is the instructions to building houses, building a healthy home, building a healthy relationship, a healthy friendship, a healthy marriage, a balanced career, being a righteous parent. Jesus says when you live, when you interact with one another, be wise. How? You put his words into practice. Well, what if I just want to wing it? You know, what if, what if I want to make my own choices? You know, the, the modern thought would say that all of this Bible stuff is out of date. I think I can make my own choices. What does Jesus say? He says, you build your house on the rock. Why? Because there's always a mess coming. He said, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the mess came. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. 
And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and the beat against that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. The only way out of your mess is to follow, to follow the light. You can't pray your way out of it. You can't confess your way out of it because it was behavior that got you into this mess. It has to be behavior that gets you out. You could have listened to Jesus' instructions. You could have not stepped into this mess, but you made a choice. You stepped into it on your own, going your own way, listening to your friends, listening to the world. You got lost on your own. But now here you are, lost, and you need a light to get you out. And I know, our pride, our pride gets in the way. We don't like to ask for help. We didn't want somebody else to take care of us. We're independent, we're strong. We got into this mess on our own. We can get our way out. But that is not how God designed the world. God loved the world so much that he sent help. The Bible says sometimes that help is divine. Sometimes it's your family. Sometimes it's the church. But there is no shame in taking help. We all need help. If life is a mess, just know that your God, he is not going to condemn you. He's not going to blame you. He's not going to shame you. That's not what Jesus is about. That's not what Christianity is about. And I can prove it. Or rather, you can prove it, right? Just think to yourself if this is true. If you've seen this happen in your own life, prove it to yourself right now. There was a time when you messed up, yeah? And it got to the point where you gave up. So in desperation, you looked up. And then miraculously, God showed up. Isn't that our story? Isn't that the story of the Bible? Well, that means that it's not just a in the past story. It's a, a now story. It's an everyday story. You and I are a, a mess, but but God showed up and he invited us to follow his son. And now we're redeemed. Now we're saved. Now we see the light. How do you do this? First, you got to take your hands off the steering wheel. You have to surrender and you have to allow God into your life. You just begin listening to his voice. Begin to seek his face. I know what when we use words like surrender, that sounds like loss. It sounds like you're losing, but it's not. Because chances are, if you're in a mess, then you've already lost. We need to give our lives over to Jesus. I really enjoyed reading the story of Jesus calling Matthew. I've been thinking a lot about Matthew this past year, his life, his story. But that calling of Matthew's story is so important. It is, because without it, well, first, we'd have no gospel of Matthew, right? Without Matthew, we wouldn't have the account of Tamar and Ruth and Bathsheba in Jesus' family tree. Matthew begins his gospel account by reminding us that even in Jesus' family tree, there were people who had messy lives. Without Matthew, we wouldn't have the story of the wise men at Christmas. Matthew gives us the longest and most detailed account of the Sermon on the Mount. Plus, Matthew's gospel is rich in detail. Only Matthew describes the resurrection of the Old Testament saints at the time of Jesus' death. Matthew 28 recounts the bribing of the soldiers at the tomb to say the body was stolen and that the whole resurrection was a cover-up. That's only in Matthew. But do you know what's really great? When he's called to follow... What makes Matthew's calling so unique compared to the other disciples is that Matthew's calling was very public, right? 
Jesus went to his place of work and in front of everyone. The people who Matthew exploited, the people who Matthew worked for, and the people who followed Jesus, you had everyone there. They all watched this happen. Jesus calls Matthew publicly in front of everyone. Matthew's sitting in a tax booth and he says, follow me, and he rose and followed him. Matthew walked off the job because his shift was over. He said, I'm out of here. He left his life to make a new life. And by dinner time, everybody was at Matthew's house. Same with Zacchaeus. Jesus called him publicly, told an entire crowd of people, I want to share a meal with you. Unheard of. Jesus wasn't afraid of the mess. He wasn't afraid of how it would look. That could be your story. Or your story could be the woman at the well. After Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, she laid down her water jar, the whole reason she was there. And she ran home so that she could bring others to see Jesus. She found a way out of her mess. She wanted her friends to know it too. And that's still our job. That is still the job of the church, not to be the blame police, not to point fingers, not to cause shame, not to cast blame. Our job is to point to Jesus. We need to drop our own water jars. Our water won't satisfy. We go and get the people and we bring them to living water. He is the way out. He is the light. Jesus came to save us all from our hot mess. And now we want Jesus to show up in the lives of our friends. You want Jesus to show up in the lives of your family. You want Jesus to show up in the lives of your friends and your coworkers and your neighbors. Or maybe you still need Jesus to show up in your own life. You're sitting there and you're realizing right now, I need the light of life. I need living water. I need a good shepherd. Here at Walden Church, we believe that following Jesus is simple. In fact, it's the first three letters of the alphabet, A, B, C. First thing, when Jesus says, follow me, is you just admit. Admit that you're not perfect. Admit that you're a sinner. Romans 3 says, all have sinned and continue to fall short of the glory of God. There's no shame. There's no shame in admitting you're not perfect. When you come to a church, you are surrounded by people that are also not perfect. You are not alone. The church is a place of people who have all admitted that they are broken. And we are a family and we are made up of people who are imperfect and who are hurting. But we all believe. We all believe in Jesus. Acts 4 says there is no salvation by anyone else. For there is no other name under heaven given among people by which he must be saved. We believe that Jesus is the Good Shepherd. We believe that he is the light of life. We believe he is the water that satisfies, and we believe that a life with him, a life following him, is better than a life without him. So we confess it. We confess it out loud. We make that declaration just like Matthew, publicly, just like Zacchaeus, publicly. Romans 10 says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Belief and confession, they are the cornerstone of salvation. And it's not about how good you are. It's not about how much you give or how long you've been coming to church or how long you've been saved. We are not saved by anything we do. We are only saved by what he did. Because Jesus came near. It was the mess that drew him to us. He did all the work. And if that sounds like the life that you want, the life you've always wanted, then I would invite you to bow your head and pray this prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus so that I could be your friend. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being with me all my life, even when I didn't know it. And I realize that I need a savior to set me free from my sin and from myself and from all the habits and hurts and hangups that mess up my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I want to repent and live the way you created me to live. 
Be the Lord of my life. Save me with your grace. I want to learn to love you and trust you and to become everything that you made me to be. Thank you for creating me and choosing me to be a part of your family. I would just say that if you prayed that prayer, that you, your next step is to connect to a local church. Trust me, you don't have to find the best church or the biggest church or the church that has the best pastor or the best music. You need to find the church that's right around the corner. A church that's made up of your neighbors, a people that live in the same area as you, that are going through the same struggles as you, people that you can meet and who can become a part of your life. And then you just need to plug in. Plug into that community, find out what their needs are and find out how you can contribute. Become a part of a church. Don't just attend. Contribute. Add to their story. And they will add to yours. I love you guys. We'll see you next week. Bye.